Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. I was uh, 28 years old and um, I was just about to graduate from the Culinary Institute of America and um, I, was on a, I was on a crazy high, man. I, was, I just uh, had worked at two of the best restaurants in New York, at La Bernadette and Oriol at the time. And, um, you know, uh, I was doing really well at culinary school. I had never done well in school before and I, I was graduating towards the top of my class. I was cocky as shit, you know, I was like, <laughs> I was full of like just complete confidence and you know even just ordering people around out of nowhere you know um just like you know strangers you know <laughs> telling you what to do you know um and I got recruited for this job out in California and um I had these dreams of just going back to Cali and uh and then so I took the job I wasn't ready for this job it was a job to run a resort and be the chef but when I got offered the job, I, I just thought and I dreamed because out of my cockiness, all I thought and dreamed about was the white chef coat and putting my name on my left chest and writing executive chef underneath and wearing the long crisp apron. And uh, so I took the job for $28,000 a year and out in the desert. And um, it was in Borrego Springs, California. And it's... Uh, it was a resort called La Casa del Zorro. It was a beautiful resort. Cabanas, five-star everything. Um, and I was there running the kitchen. And uh, it's funny, in my life, uh, I, ha I have this weird thing in my life where I, I end up always becoming friends with people that maybe I don't speak the same language of or I didn't grow up in the same way, and especially in the kitchen with a lot of Latino. Uh, cooks and dishwashers and waiters and bussers and uh, there was this man Salvador um, he was our dishwasher at the time and he had this body almost like Jack Black you know and uh, <laughs> this red beautiful face and uh, always a grin on his face I mean no matter how hard his job was every day he always seemed to be looking at us like yo everything is good you know and um, but we never really talked we just always like we always just exchanged whistles, to be honest. They would be like, let's, let's go, you know. I got you, you know, what are they? let's go. And then that, so that was like our whole relationship. But then he approached me one day, but he would always look at me, and then he approached me one day and he asked me if I could help him out with something. Um, he needed, his, his, his family couldn't help him the next day, and he asked me if I could help him, and I didn't, there was no one in, that I was with in the desert. Um, I went there all by myself, so I said yes. And then I remember the next morning, he came to my doorstep. It was really early. It was 5.30 a.m. And I don't know if any of you have been to the desert or lived in the desert, but it gets bright really, really early in the desert. And where we lived in Borrego, it uh, was in the middle of the Anza Borrego Desert, which is the northeast end of San Diego County. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing place. It's uh, sand everywhere, beautiful Ocotillo cactus. Ocotillo cactus spreads it starts from the bottom and it spreads outward into these long rods, almost like 12 feet high, into a blooming cactus. And then there was Choya cactus, which are smaller cactus that live more towards the ground, but have these almost like, um, they're like a cotton, t like a bunny tail, spiky bunny tail, cotton candy looking kind of uh, branches that, that blow in the wind and they can knock you out, they're crazy. Um, but he pulled up to my, and it gets really bright in the morning, he pulled up to my house that morning, and I still remember it. it uh, I looked out the window, and uh, he rolled up, and there was this cloud of dust, and he was standing there like the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> and uh, he was holding two cups of Nescafe coffee, and he was just there, and it was just like, he had this red pickup truck, and I was like, and he looked at me, he's like, listo. And then I said, all right, yeah, yeah, listo, let's go. And, vamonos. and then um, got in the truck, and we headed east. Um, and we headed east through the desert, through an area called Fonts Point, which is like a canyon that was, and a bunch of dry lakes, and we headed towards the Salton Sea, towards Coachella. And we went around and under the south bend of the, the Salton Sea, um, and cut across to this town called Mecca, which is on the eastern end of the Salton Sea, 
where a lot of farms are, a lot of migrant workers, a lot of immigrants that come directly from Tijuana and Mexicali. And this is kind of their first stop for many of them. And it was, uh, it was really early. It takes about an hour to get there. So we, it, by that time, it was only about 7 a.m. in the morning. There was uh, workers everywhere passing, and we passed through a bunch of date trees, and uh, again, more cactus, the Salton Sea, um, which is a very strange lake. You know, it's uh, filled with salt and dead fish around, and there's uh, motels with, you know, broken windows and broken signs hanging. And, um, and we followed this road down, and there was this crooked sign that said Chivo. And, um, and a bunch of goats were just kind of prancing in the field. There's a bunch of dudes there, and Salvador got out. And um, the crazy thing about Latino culture sometimes that I see is like, they, even if you don't know each other, you seem like you know each other. And, uh, and I don't know, you know, it's obviously the language, but uh, I think there's a common and shared experience, um, especially in America, where a, uh, a lot of, almost everyone had to come through the country in the same way and in the same experience. So there's this silent understanding. And, um, and then the language itself lends itself to be, to move itself away from any type of foreplay and go right into it, you know, and just be like, yo, what's up, you know? And um, so he was talking to the guy and then they made the exchange and they put the goat in the back. And it was a beautiful little goat. Um, uh, I remember it was a white coat with uh, little, little spots of uh, brown and um, beautiful small head and small little horns. And um, I, I had no idea what the heck we were doing. <laughs> I was just going along for the ride, drinking a free cup of coffee, you know? And uh, it, I, I was, I mean, I was very naive. I, I, I didn't really think about what was going on. I thought we were picking up a pet, to be honest. And then, so then we put the goat back and we drove back to Borrego, back through the desert. And we went to his house and he let the goat out. And again, I'm thinking, everything's okay. And um, but then there's that moment where you start to see clues. And then, <laughs> and then uh, as we walked into his backyard, I looked to my left and I saw a table, a small little table with knives on it. And then I saw some, a rope hanging from a hangman's kind of noose. And um, then I saw him go over and start to fill a bottle, a Corona bottle, empty Corona bottles with water and salt. And um, I didn't, we, again, we didn't really talk, you know, we're just chilling. Um, <laughs> but it's still really early. It's, uh, by this time, it's only like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. The sun is really hot. And, uh, and he looks at me again, and he asks me again, listo? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. And then we started running after the goat. <laughs> and, um, and it was like Rocky, you know, with the chicken. And then like we were running after it. And I remember the goat, the goat was up in the corner, you know, way up in the corner. He was, I swear, it was like he was looking at me like, ugh. He was, he was, you know, he was like trying to juke me like, like Barry Sanders, you know, like he was like looking which way to go. And then like Salvador went from the left, I went from the right. We couldn't catch him. And then all of a sudden I, I felt something and he, Salvador came from like up in the clouds like a lucha libre and jumped <laughs> right onto the goat and got him in a headlock. And then he started yelling at me. La botella de agua y sal, la botella. And then he told me to get the bottles. And then I gave him the bottles. And then he just took the, the goat and started feeding water, this, this, this solution to the goat. And it looked really, really beautiful for a moment. And then, <laughs> and then once the goat drank all the salted water, it, he, pulled, he pulled the goat over. And I, at that moment, I started, I started to see things change very rapidly. You know, um, I. You know, I'd cooked at this point for a while, and I'd butchered a lot of meat, but I've ne I'd never killed an animal before. And, um, and he was just so natural about it. He wrapped the rope around the hind legs, pulled the goat up. The goat's horns were maybe a, a centimeter above the dirt. And, um, and I remember that goat. I, I remember it every day of my life now, you know, Right at that moment, that goat was looking straight at me in the eye. And um, I don't know if it was really looking at me or if it was my imagination or it's that, that feeling when you have when like, you think that every baby is looking at you and recognizes you. But, 
But I, I, I remember that moment, those eyes were staring straight at me and almost crying out to me to like, say, yo, man, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> you know, like, fucking help me, man. And, um, and those, those eyes were huge, like the sun. And then right at that moment when the eyes like open, Salvador, I, Salvador came up with a knife and slit that neck. And then the, and the goat's neck snapped back and the blood fell from the neck. And then he went right to work on the, uh, the belly and split, the, split the, the hide, opened it up, pulled out the guts. And, um, and he looked at me and he, and he reminded me about the bottle. And he was, he was teaching me. He was teaching me what was going on. And he explained to me that this solution um, didn't make the gut, it, it would, when you cut the, the belly open, that the guts wouldn't smell. And I realized that, that there was no smell. And um, so we went to work from there. You know, he showed me how to pull the hide off. We moved it over to the table, broke it down into primals and subprimals, um, packed it up and wrapped it. We had the music going, we were playing. You know, at that time, this was the late 90s, so was, we were playing music from Juan Sebastian and, and um, uh, Grupo Limite was, was in Banda del Recodo, and uh, all that music was going on, and you know, the sun was creeping up, and uh, we were packing and wrapping it in Ziploc and plastic wrap, putting it in glues and ice. Took a moment, had a cigarette and a beer, and it was like 11 o'clock. <laughs> You know, and then, then we jumped in the car, put everything in, and then we went down to Mexicali. We drove about, it's about an hour south. We drive through the town. Uh, we go through Imperial Valley, basically. Drive through Calipatria, Brawley, and um, El Centro, and you enter Mexicali, which a lot of people call Sexicali. They, it's a, you can find some of the best Chinese food in the world there, which um, you may not know, but you can. And, um, and we went through into town and went to his mom's restaurant. And uh, we went through a screen door, and there were a bunch of ladies in there. And uh, you know that feeling when, like, you're made to feel like you're late when you weren't even late, you know? <laughs> like, like, you know, when, especially when mothers do that to you, you know? Like, like where you been? But it's like, you, there was no, they didn't, you know, there was no time you were supposed to arrive in the first place. <laughs> you know, so, like, they were there, and it was like, oh, and then all of a sudden when you arrived, then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, you wasted my whole day, and now I can get to work, you know? <laughs> but they were already cutting the, the cilantro and the onions and the garlic, and um, they brought the goat, and she brought me over, and I have this weird connection also with like mothers and grandmothers where when I walk in, they pull me over always, and then they want me to cook with them. It's really weird. And, um, and then so she showed me how to, how to make media, basically. And, um, you know, they were wearing flower aprons and all the knives were really worn and, you know, there, there was wrinkles on their faces and they were tasting with their thumbs and their fingers and, um, and I sat down and then helped them and they fed me the most wonderful bowl of uh, goat stew in my life, you know, and then we got back in the truck and we headed back over the border and, you know, I crossed the border a different man, you know. Um, I felt like I knew everything about cooking when I, when I went to that town, the small town, I kind of, I looked down on them in a way like I was this like crazy chef, you know, amazing young chef from New York City that was going to show this desert town like how to cook. Um, but I came back a different man and, you know, we went back to work and about a month later, Salvador called me again and asked me if I was ready and I told him, <laughs> I told him, vamonos. <laughs> <laughs> 